Major support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their family, their finances, and their futures. High Point University, the premier life skills university, focused on preparing students for the world as it is going to be. HPU's call to action is choose to be extraordinary. And Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Was the threat of Y2K and the meltdown or the possible meltdown really 20 years ago? Were we in the middle of the Great Recession 10 years ago? And now are we really experiencing the longest economic expansion in U.S. history since Reconstruction? Happy New Year. Welcome again to the most widely watched source of Carolina business policy and public affairs. I am Chris William, and as we continue on these two special installments of Carolina Business Review, last week we reflected on the year that was last year, but this week we will deal with where we're headed. How long will this expansion continue? What are some of those landmines, or what could disrupt or be a negative surprise, and how does policy and community affairs and factors into all of it. In a moment, we'll start again with our four resident economists who will enjoin in a moment. Stay with us. Gratefully acknowledging support by Martin Marietta, a leading provider of natural resource-based building materials, providing the foundation upon which our communities improve and grow. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at Bearings.com. This is the Carolina Business Review Annual Economic Forecast, featuring Sarah House of Wells Fargo Securities, Dr. John Connaughton of UNC Charlotte, Dr. Doug Woodward from the University of South Carolina, and Dr. Frank Hefner of the College of Charleston. Happy New Year. Um, is it hard to believe it's 2020? It's a little tough. Okay. <laughs> yes, it's a good way to put it. Yeah, Sarah, let's start with you. Is it inevitable that we are going to have a slowdown, and could it be this year? It's inevitable at some point we will see a slowdown, I think, from the rates of growth we've registered really over the past two years, particularly versus 2018. But not necessarily that it's it's going to be in, in 2020. So I think some of that inevitability just comes from the underlying growth drivers, drivers of this economy, including slowing population growth, lower productivity. Mm -hmm. And so really that 2% that trend is, is probably somewhere where, where we're at. Is there anyone yeah. around this table that doesn't believe we're going to have a slowdown at some point? Well, well, at some point in what, a hundred years? I mean, right. you know, we'll yes. Uh, is it inevitable? No, it's not. And, and, and the thing is, the, the, sort of the theory that what goes up must come down really is a function of what drove it up. Uh, and, and so, we, why is this economy growing? And, and I think we, you know, some words that have been used in the past on that is because the resiliency. It's absolutely amazing to me how well U.S. industry has adapted to all sorts of uncertainties and worked around it. Uh, British industry has worked out real well for the last four years on the uncertainty of what is going to happen with Brexit. So that kind of resiliency has forced more innovation. Uh, different supply chains, and so I don't. I don't see necessarily that uh, we're going to have a slowdown just because. And let me all. let me just take a sidebar on that. Do you think that the outcome of the British elections a couple of weeks ago now mm -hmm. are a tailwind for the U.S.? No, I do not. Okay, all right. I think we're about to enter the Roaring Twenties, uh, and <laughs> you remember the Roaring Twenties and the nineteen <laughs> hundreds. Uh, actually, started with a recession. Uh, and then they roared, and then we had the Great Depression. I'm not saying we don't follow predictable patterns right. in economics. The business cycle doesn't have this regularity to it. But uh, th th eventually, uh, and not 
2020, but 2021, I think we should be very concerned about a recession, primarily because I think investment's gonna slow down. There, you know, we just don't, we don't see a lot of growth in investment right now, and, if, and we gotta keep watching that. And if, if businesses aren't investing, I don't think there's a lot of confidence this economy can continue. Mm -hmm. And it, we're gonna have a slow economy in any case. But um, a recession eventually will, will occur, I think, in a, in a year or two. Okay, um, let's Oops. distinguish between recession and slowdown. Okay, all right, okay? good point. Uh, inevitable that this economy will probably have a slowdown maybe late 2020, early 2021, okay? Um, but will it, and, and it, may, it may rise to the level that the National Bureau of Economic Research, who def which group defines when we were in recession as an overall decline in economic activity? Might in what, say two quarters? No, no, no. They don't say two quarters. We have a lot of That's criteria. the rule of thumb, and the rule yeah. of thumb definition is two successive quarters of downturn in GDP. But that's not what the NBER uh, uses in terms of defining a recession. And all of those recessions, that, uh, all of that expansions that we talked about last uh, episode. Uh, the 33, and this is the longest one. That's all by NBER definitions, okay? So we're not gonna see a rule of thumb recession. It's just not gonna happen. Uh, we're not gonna see success of two quarters anytime soon. Uh, we may see a slowdown. We may see half percent growth for a couple of quarters, something along those lines in the next year or two. Uh, but I don't think we're gonna see that big deep dive recession. For several of the things we talked about in the last episode, we talked about the change in, in the way, it, what, what we're doing, the number of people employed in manufacturing, mm -hmm. et cetera. We're not gonna see those big layoffs anymore. So slower growth and it'll bump along at slower growth before it picks back up again? Yes. You think that's the bottom of this? That's our expectation is, mm -hmm. so we actually see growth slowing in the first part of the year, but I think there's the potential for, for a bit of a bounce back in the second half of the year if we can get a little bit more clarity on, on some of the policy trade. Uh, front, trade specifically, but yeah, also you have easier. Next it will year. be a positive. But also you have, right. and, and you have um, easier monetary policy that's still filtering through mm -hmm. into the system. So I think that's going to be a tailwind mm -hmm. in the second half of next year, too. So I'd like to reemphasize my last statement before. Things are different. And, and let me point out one uh, clear indication Paul Volcker just passed away. Things were different back then in the 1980s compared to now. So yes, I think we've got a, di a different kind of an economy now. So a lot of the forecasting is going to be a little bit harder to do. But the issues of trade, clearly. Inflation? In I mean, there's no inflation hawks out there because there isn't any. We have no inflation. Well, I think there is some inflation. You yeah. know, it depends on what you're purchasing. Some things are yeah. going up, like, as you know, the cost but, of But I've gone on record at so many talks yeah. in the last five, six years of predicting. <laughs> you've forgotten what you predicted? No, I know exactly what I predicted. <laughs> Interest rates have to go up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, inflation has to pick up. But, you, but, but Frank, not to push back on you, but you said this time it's different. So why do interest rates have to go up? They don't. Apparently. Yeah, that's your point. That's my point. Okay. They do not have to. I was relying on old models. And you know, before before we went on the air here, Sarah, you were right to say we've got to be careful when we start talking about trade because a trade deal could change three or four different ways mm -hmm. within a week. So mm -hmm. let's just assume that we're not going to have the final, final, final phase of a U.S.-China trade. How does that look to deploy and affect any kind of expansion or continued expansion? Well, I think I, I think that keeps a lid on investment spending. So even yeah. capex domestically, exactly. So even with some phase one deal, I think just the fact that the the trade and tariff card has been played so so prominently over uh, the past year is that businesses are still a little bit on on guard, and so it's tough to see when things might flare up if um, if China doesn't necessarily adhere to to some of the terms of the agreement. Do we see this this flare up again? And so I think um, there is still a lot of uncertainty surrounding trade for, for 2020. Mm -hmm. Well, there's uncertainty surrounding trade with China, but there's certainty surrounding trade with NAFTA and Mexico now. We're going to get Do you think this. that's the bigger deal? Oh, yes, yes, I do for our market. Yes, absolutely. And and it was negotiated. It you know, you got to give Trump credit. He used tariffs. He got them to the negotiating table. They produced a deal that they uh, it's bipartisan now. It looks like it's going to pass. Mexico's for it. Canada's for it. Everybody's going to win with this. And this is what he was put in office to do, to get this done. And he used the tariffs. He got them to the table. Also with South Korea, we got a free trade agreement with Japan. It's just China that's the problem right now, but everything else in trade is starting to stabilize and we're into a new era now. Yeah, After Brexit, we'll, we'll do a unilateral deal with, yeah. with uh, Britain this year. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and you know, again, a couple of things. 
people need to understand. President can do unilateral deal on his mm -hmm. own, mm -hmm. okay? It's only multilateral, multilateral deals that require congressional approval. And going forward, we're only gonna be seeing unilateral deals and they're gonna be more and more of those. This is the new era of trade that we're do, in. Do you think the possibility of yep. Brexit under the new uh, leadership in the UK uh, is greater and will it, how, how does it play out in the US? I, I'm not sure that it's gonna be a big deal in, in 2020 in the US because it's gonna take most of 2020 to figure out a deal between the U.S. and, and uh, Great Britain. Um, I want to say one more thing, though, about trade in general and, and the so-called trade war. And I think this is important for everyone to understand. If you look at the last three quarters of 2019 and you look at our export activity and you look at our import activity, with tariffs on our imports mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. retaliatory tariffs on our exports, and you know what? They didn't change a bit during that period of time. They were both basically flat for about nine months. But what? Are, and well, so, well, not the, out of Charleston. No, we we, I, we're running into a, a problem you know where, where yeah. you know you look at the Ports Authority in Charleston. Yeah. Yes. and they're very bald about their about well, we, what they, their numbers are. There, there are two numbers that we need to look at. One is the declining container traffic, but more importantly, the number of empties, and, and the number of empties has increased. Uh, in the last Those are the ones that go back to China. Oh, no, they, we, we got them both imported empties yeah. and exported yeah. empties. We got them going both ways, and we need to get those filled. <laughs> um, we, we learned on discussions on this program over the last 12 to 18 months, I'm going to say, it could be longer than that, from officials in both uh, commerce departments in North Carolina and South Carolina, that they didn't have as much in the pipeline as they had in previous years. Yeah. And a lot of it was because of the uncertainty around trade. When does that start to show up? Uh, I think that's behind us. I really do. I think there was a lot of uncertainty in 2019. 20, going forward, you know, in 2019, tariffs with China rose as high as 40% on autos, and we're an auto producing cluster mm -hmm. in South Carolina. It was and debilitating on some And it, it, it mm -hmm. hurt, yeah, and it, they, um, companies like BMW and others had to readjust their strategy, what they're gonna do in China. They put investment in China um, that could have gone in here for the X series, but they're realigning their whole strategy. They've made those adjustments, I think, And this now. is the BMW uh, operation you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they were affected by this for, yeah, for sure because of the tariffs. 40% on, on autos coming into China is a big market for them, export market out of, out of Charleston, well, out of the upstate and into Charleston. But they've come back down, so I think we can handle these tariffs in the range of 10, 15%, mm -hmm. but big spikes like that, they're disruptive. I don't think that's gonna happen in 2020, though. Plus, we've seen, it, it, I, I, I think, a pretty rapid response to the supply chain as it relates that's to a lot right. of companies. That's the resiliency and, of the business. And, yeah, and I think that um, you know those, those changes are taking place in 2019, they're taking place in 2020. Um, by the end of this year, I think that a lot of changes will be made in terms of the way that supply chain between right. the U.S. and China works. Yeah, um, adjustments are being not going to. It's not going to matter at that point in time. And the other issue is, even if we're even if we're going into a slowdown, we are still the largest consumer economy, mm -hmm. and, and so there is still reason for companies to move into the Carolinas to continue to expand. And if they're so uncertain what about you... trade and, and uh, you know, using the U.S. Uh, to, to export mm -hmm. to from Europe or from, they're gonna start investing more here because right. they wanna be in the most, one of the most lucrative markets. Well, that was the, the Japanese automobile market. response. Exactly, in the decades 80s. Ago. And yeah. I think yeah. we're gonna get some investment as a result mm -hmm. of this, but it's, it's it, these decisions take time. But mm -hmm. I think in the next few years, you'll see mm -hmm. investment coming on shore into manufacturing. It's gonna be good for the Carolinas. So how would you forecast consumer spending since you've said, you know, talked about the largest part of the, the economy, two-thirds of it is consumer spending. Right. So what does it look like? Looks good. We have two things going for us. We have uh, finally wages are starting to creep up and certainly in certain tight uh, sectors. And the other one is we keep generating jobs. That just means more people are working, so that means more consumer spending. I'd yeah. say also just the balance sheet positions of households. So the savings mm -hmm. rate about tw is about twice as high as what we saw in the mid 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, you've seen wealth continue to climb, not just at the upper end, but mm -hmm. also for for some of the the more middle income and and lower income households as well. And so there's there's some cushion there. Um, when we look at the overall spending picture, though, we think we'll probably see a little bit of a moderation in part because inflation is going to creep up a, a little bit. Um, but overall, should should remain pretty strong next yeah, what year. What Sarah said is really important. We've got consumer spending really positive, but the savings rate going up at the same time. Best of that's, both worlds? Yes, unusual, yeah. this yeah. is what Highly we want. I know, I know you've been a big proponent of that. You say, it doesn't get any better than this, but uh, 
uh, well, but people still yeah. and people, businesses, small businesses, corporations are sitting on a lot of cash, mm -hmm. which means they're yeah. resilient. Yeah, and they can they yes. can weather any kind of uncertainties, and that's what they're doing. And right? one last thing: negative interest rates in Europe mm -hmm. pushing money. Yeah, here, here, keeping our right. rates low. Right. It's one of the reasons the Fed ri dropped the rates in the second Good. half of 2019, mm -hmm. uh, and it's also what led to the three-day terror when the in inverted okay. yield curve occurred. Right. Okay, can, can, can that be sustainable in the U.S.? Could well, we see negative interest rates? Uh, in a recession, and, maybe if yeah. things got really bad. We've had it well, off and on at weird moments in the past also. Well, real rates, yeah, but yeah. Not, not... No, no, actually, we're, you know, 90-day uh, T-bills were bought at a yeah. premium. We've had that in the last yeah. couple All of right, years. All right, well, let's, let's, let's take this out a little bit yeah. further. Let's try to look around a corner. If the Fed continues to use the tools they've been using, and that is an interest rate adjustment on the downside, at some point we run out of interest rate adjustments. Right. Uh, even at two and a quarter percent, we've got some room. I, I, well, I thought we had negative rates. Well, we, yeah. Well, we're at <laughs> one, we're one and a half. Used to be, we thought yeah, that was well, between low one and a half and one seventy-five right now in the federal fund. So yeah. we've got a little downward movement, but that's not going to be the principal okay. tool of the Fed yeah, going right. forward. Right. Okay. It's going to be two things: interest on excess reserves and in terms of pushing money out of that big excess reserve pile, which is what trillion and a half right now in, in the system. Uh, of excess reserves. Take your word for it. Yeah, and the second thing that is is the Fed balance sheet, their actual intervention into some markets, um, and sopping up some of the some of the uh, issuance. It's a variation of quantitative easing, but they're not calling that anymore. Exactly. It's just yeah. buying assets. Yeah. What? 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. So we talked about trade, just to some mm -hmm. small degree. One of the underpinnings of trade in the Carolinas is transportation and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It seems like. DOTs in both states are always in a reactive mode. And right. it's not its not any criticism about the way DOT works, <laughs> but as funders of that, as as, in, as communities, we, we tend not to think progressively about transportation issues. Well, we have to change the way we think about congested places like Charleston and Charlotte and Raleigh and the upstate of South Carolina. Will this have to be, is transportation going to be a, a bottleneck for growth for us? I think it already is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, has you hear been, a lot of complaints has with been manufacturing. Years, yeah. So, well, along with a labor shortage, I think that this is the you know this is the fundamental problem we face for long-term economic growth. We should be making the investments now. The economy is good. Tax revenue is right. coming in. They should be uh, you know preparing for the future. But we're not doing it. This is a political problem, not an economic. I don't know why they can't get this done. You go to China, they can build infrastructure. Uh, we should get them to come over here and teach us how to do it. it it's uh, a regulation problem, Doug. Yeah. It, it, in, in the Federal Highway Administration does not allow for projections of traffic in building roads. And so you can't say, well... They don't it, allow it or they just don't fund it, which means they don't incentivize it. it. You call it whatever you want to call it. Okay. But it, <laughs> it, 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 you can only use existing uh, traffic. You cannot pr do projections in terms of road size. And so that's basically what, what has been constraining. And that's been in place for, for decades. And it's, I think, partly trying to move us from... Uh, individual private cars to more mass transit in urban areas. Which we're not developing. But in South Carolina, we are developing another inland port. So yeah. that, that's going to... Dillon. Yeah, Dillon. So that's going to help ameliorate some of that. And, oh, and that's also an anticipation of continued growth, which we're when we say infrastructure, see. you know, we don't need just to expand it, but improve what we have, repair the bridges, put, you know, a, a, a better signage and, and, and uh, just make the roads in much better shape so that when we have autonomous vehicles, you know, they'll be able to use these. So you go to other countries, they're doing this. So this political, is as you said, it's a political problem, yeah. not an economic problem. Well, it's an economic problem. Well, the money's there. I mean, I think they, if, if not now, when? Is there any sympathy that it could change? It almost will take a crisis, like a bridge collapsing or something like that, to wake them up, and then they're going to put a big bill together. We but had they, that in Minneapolis a few years ago, and it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. <laughs> so on the brighter side, <laughs> yeah, uh, this okay, is, on the brighter yeah, side, yes. student debt. No, no student debt, hand. yeah, but it's a good time to graduate. <laughs> right. It, it is a great time to graduate, and, and, and there's so many of our my students is like, well, you're graduating in May. What are you going to do? Is, well, I think I'm going to wait a while to find the perfect job. Take a gap year. Because, well, they, 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 see, they feel as if they're, they're comfortable enough where they're going to find something. So but They're um, still going to pay off the debt, so they're going to get in the job yeah. market. Yes. Is, yeah. the, is the student debt a bubble? I don't believe it is. I think it is a long-term problem. It's it's certainly big, but in terms of it does it have the potential to spark a financial crisis? I just don't think it does because if you look at who's the major holder of it, 
it's the government. Mm -hmm. So it's it's government backed. It's, it's nowhere still near about household debt. Yeah, it's yeah. still it's still about an eighth the size of the mortgage market yeah. was in in the 2000s. And so I think really how you how it's going to play out is it's, it's going to be a, a slow burn issue. So it's going to push back exactly. housing um, housing purchases. It's going to weigh on other types of consumer spending. But in terms of a, a blow up bubble, I, I don't. I don't Even think though that's we have risk. CDOs and student debt, <laughs> no, but it's still it's, very small. Very small. It's still she's very right. small. It's absolutely right in terms of it's not it's not a big bubble mm. problem. It's a pushback problem in terms of the way the, the millennials will behave. The good news is that North and South Carolina, student debt's not as big an issue as it is in some other states because we have very extensive higher ed, public higher education with reasonable tuition do, rates. Do, you know, I don't want to go too, too far down this, this, this road, but doesn't the, isn't the student debt say something about higher education financing and funding? And I, and I understand I think it says more about parents. There's only not one on this panel yes, that does not work for education. a higher ed. Right. Yeah. I you get know, where that. do we get this idea that you have to go into debt, you know, to, to pay for higher education? People should, don't save anymore for education. And we have, and, you know, we have saving plans that allow yeah. them to put money away. And Excellent. they're not being used. But yeah. they're also and there's so responsible many other for saving options. for a lot of other things, like their own retirement at, at the same time, which didn't used to be the case either. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you've seen the cost of, of education go up much faster than right. really any other category, including Isn't including, that a problem? Including medical care. Isn't that a problem? It's, well, you have to look at what's the, what's the opportunity on the other side. But doesn't, so. doesn't and again, I, I don't want, the last, con, last question about this. Mm -hmm. It turns going into a, it turns, Applying for a college and getting into a, a, a decent college is, is almost getting into an exclusive club. Can you afford yep. it? Will you be accepted? That uh, is not inclusive, and that becomes a more exclusive thing, and doesn't that turn into a financial problem for a lot of families that can't afford to do that? Uh, especially if they don't graduate, so I'm not sure. You know, I think if you look at the undergraduate average student loan debt and what they're what they're getting, so yes, it's it is a, a lot more than previous generations, but the payoff is still there in terms of that yeah. those better job opportunities. Yeah, I think where you really get into trouble is for those that that attend for some time but don't come out with with okay. the degree and therefore don't have those opportunities. Uh, politics of 2020. It's certainly a wow. presidential year, John. I'm sure you have an opinion. No, no about opinion that. on this one. <laughs> yeah. Does 2020 become overshadowed does the economy in 2020 become overshadowed with the politics of the day or maybe that just the opposite does the economy overshadow the politics uh, you know the election years are always fun um, in terms of what's going on in the economy uh, I think the Fed has tried to st stake out a position we're not going to do a darn thing for the next six months that's basically what they're saying uh, they're gonna go wait and see they're gonna be very very slow they're gonna try not to intervene in an economy to make it go up or go down in order to try to not be involved in the political cycle. Um, and so I think the economy is going to have to go on its own. And I think how well it does, how well the economy does over the next nine months is going to have a big impact on the outcome of the presidential okay. election. Okay, since you're in Charlotte, does the uh, Republican National Convention in Charlotte affect that question one way or another, or is that just about Charlotte? It's just about Charlotte. Okay. Yeah, right. Frank, what do you think about the politics of the year? I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> yeah. That's hard to believe that you want I know, I know. <laughs> it's just, but I, I mean, the, the economics are, you know, fine, but the politics are the politics, and who knows what the issue is going to be. Uh, I, I mean, there's so much going on out there that uh, various policies that are being made that have economic consequences, but uh, uh, the status of the economy at the time is not going to be the driving force of the election. One, one of the things that we did see, were you going to say something? Well, I just say about the politics, I think we're, gonna, we're all agreeing we're going to have a, a good, healthy economy this year. We're going into an election where that should be good for an incumbent, but I don't think that's going to matter, yeah. actually. There are going to be other issues mm -hmm. that will overshadow the economy, and we'll see how the election turns out. But I don't think it's, it's, it's a good economy is necessarily a positive for the incumbent. Just remember James well, Carville. It's all, the economy it's, all, it's all about the economy. <laughs> yeah. uh, about a minute and a half left. Sarah, you know, for a while there, we had a head of steam going on in healthcare around consolidations of hospitals, providers. Will we see that pick back up again? And will we see some salient national healthcare plan? 
That's, I, I think it's it's tough to say. I think, you know, as we talk about the election, I think one thing to keep an eye on too is not just the, the White House, but also what happens with Congress. Mm -hmm. So um, depending on if you can get um, the both both sides of, of Congress and the, and the White House controlled by the same party, that really increases the chance of at least one major policy legislation being pushed through in, in the next president's term. But I think, um, you know, it, it remains to be seen whether, you know, you Either both Democrats mm -hmm. or, or Republicans could control both sides of Congress. Hospital mergers, we're going to start seeing that pick up again. How, how, how much is left? <laughs> of hospitals or time in the program? No, in terms of merging. Because <laughs> you have 30 seconds. Oh, That's in terms of merging. Time. I mean, it's, it's been on a frantic pace. It's, it's part of the problem of health care costs. Um, and, you know, I, I think Sarah is right. I think that nothing's going to happen this year. It's 2021, what happens in the election and whether or not. We get a one-sided result one way or the other uh, in terms of dealing with health care costs. Agree? And no, no comment on health care. <laughs> you, you say that, and then you go on to no, I'll wait till so someone else says <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're, we're out of time anyway. Yeah. Thank you for being yeah. on the program. Seriously, we always enjoy this. You Thank guys you. are... Uh, Gals are nice. I'm using guys in the. I'm, I'm from California. We yeah. guys, okay, guys well, you know. generic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for being on the program. Happy New Year to you all. Same and, to you. Uh, thanks for sharing thank so freely and joining us here. Uh, until next week, and um, we hope your business is good. Happy holidays. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by High Point University, Martin Marietta, Colonial Life, The Duke Endowment, Barings, Grant Thornton, Sonoco. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.